Hello everyone, uh, this is Matthew Bussin from TrainFarm. So today we will discuss a topic in time series and forecasting named as ARIMA. ARIMA is Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average Method which is used for forecasting or predicting the future values of a time series and we will particularly discuss on how to conduct this analysis and get generate forecast using base, two basic stuff softwares one is Minitab, the other one is RStudio. So let's get into the details of this. So as I told you, ARIMA, ARIMA stands for Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average. So here, when to use ARIMA is a question uh, which we will need to be very clear uh, with a good reply or a good answer um, before we start this lecture. So. ARIMA is used when there is a strong seasonality or a trend or a both uh, present in your time series data, right? So AR stands for autoregression where uh, MA is moving average and I stands for integrated, as I told you, right? So the objective of ARIMA is basically to predict the future values of your time series by making your data stationary, right? I've, I've, I've highlighted this group of words, time series stationary. The reason why I want to emphasize on this, by making your time series stationary, you are trying to identify the various components in your time series using ARIMA, right? You know, you have an AR component, you are an MA component, and you have a differencing component, right? So you are trying to extract these components, right, from the time series data. And after extracting this, you use these components to create forecasts for that very same time series. So to generate the forecast first, you need to make your time series real stationary, right? It is only then possible to extract all the information required to figure out the components of AR, MA, and I from your data series or time series to build a model to create forecasts for future, okay? So you must be wondering what these words PDQ and AR, I and MA are. Don't worry. Let's discuss on those topics one by one. So AR stands for autoregressive, which is the number of components in AR is denoted by the letter P. That's what you can see here. So autoregression is a phenomenon which is expected in a time series data. So autoregression means correlation between two data points right so in in a time series model which is ordered through time it is expected that the first variable or the first data point may be related to the second data point and that correlation is strongest when it comes to subsequent points right so or it could have a correlation between the first data point having a correlation between the third data point the first data point having a correlation between the fourth data point so on and so forth right so the correlation exists because it is timely ordered. So some of some instances or some events during that time period may influence the next data point in that series because of the impact that event made on that data point, right? This is how correlation gets built, right? So that's called as AR piece, where there is a correlation between data points in a time series. So we will try and learn, we are trying to learn what is the degree of correlation and where exactly the correlation exists in this time series. Is it between two subsequent uh, data points or is it from one data point probably um, to another data point which is three time periods ahead to it whatsoever it is right so we'll need to 
know that that information is key for us to create a forecast. In the second term is the MA term, what you can see here, which is called as moving average. The components are notated um, by the letter Q, the small letter Q. So moving average, don't get confused. This is not the moving average, what we discussed in the ratio to moving average, that's different. Here the term moving average stands for the errors, the correlation between the errors. So AR was talking about the correlation between the data points where moving errors or moving average is talking about the correlation between the errors. So obviously, as you know, that when you predict, there will be a corresponding actual value also for that prediction, right? So we make some predictions for tomorrow and then we will observe the performance and we take the actual value. So predicted versus actual. So if I take a difference between the predicted versus actual, I get the error component. So I will have an error component for each and every data point in a time series. So I'm going to study regarding the correlation between these errors, right? How the error one is correlated to error T minus one how error one is correlated to error, error t is correlated to error t minus two. The same study is done and we want to identify what's the kind of, what's the level of correlation between data points, if at all there is a correlation which exists, right? And we need the number of where exactly these correlation happens because is it a first order or first lag correlation or a second lag correlation means the first data point is correlated to the second or first data point is correlated to the third or vice versa. So we need to know till which point does that correlation exist in this time series data, right? And those many components are to be used in our ALIMA model, right, to create the forecast. The last term is I, which is called as integrated. We are integrating AR and MI to make the data stationary. We go ahead and take a difference between data points. It could be a first order difference, second order difference. The same way I told you, it could be difference between subsequent data points or the first data point to the third data point. This is done to make the data stationary, right? So that number of differences we take, we denote it by a letter D. So these three basic ingredients are required for me to generate an ARIMA forecast, right? These are the building blocks for my ARIMA forecast. Okay, so now we have spoken about the basics of it and I was, I kept on pressing on one word stationary, stationary data, right? So how do you make the data stationary, right? That's, that's very important for you to understand at this point in time. So, so as I told you for, in order to generate a, a solid and a reliable forecast, first you need to make, and of course to use Rima you first need to make the data stationary, right? So when you make the data stationary, that means um, one of the indications to see whether your data is stationary is uh, that, you know, it does not have an influence of a trend. Or it does not have an influence of seasonality. It is just flows. And if I try to put an average line, that would be a straight line, which can be used as a representative line for the entire time series. So that is where, you know, my data is residing somewhere um, in, in, in a stationary way with a constant mean across the time zone. So that's stationary data to me. So how do you get there? When you have, when your data is under the influence of trend, seasonality, variance problems, um, how do you get the data stationary, right? The first one is to get uh, the differencing out of it. We just discussed about the integrated I, which stands for taking the difference to make the data stationary. So you could take a difference between subsequent data points, right? By doing it, right? You're trying to take the difference in case if there is an immediate trend. You're trying to take the difference and put it in the time series chart again, right? So if there is a small positive or a negative trend in the time series data, if you are taking the differences, that means you are you are trying to um, reduce that magnitude and trying to take away or remove the trend or a seasonality component from your data set, which the resultant may give you a stationary, stationary data, right? 
So that's one way of looking at it. You could take a first order difference or a second order difference. The first order difference is between two subsequent data points. That's the first order difference. Second order difference is where you know you're taking the second order difference of those subsequent points. So it, it keep continuing till the data is, is stationary. Generally, we don't go beyond second order differencing. So that's that's the rule of thumb. Um, and and if your data is not stationary, even by doing uh, differencing, there are a few other techniques what we can use. Uh, the second is transformation. This technique is used uh, typically when the variance is not stabilized uh, in a data point. That means you, you see seasonality, but the magnitude of that seasonality keeps increasing or decreasing as when you move through your time series. So that means it's a multiplicative effect. That means a variance is not constant across all the seasonal periods. Here is when I will go ahead and take the logarithm of the original data series to kill this variance um, or, you know, in um, the different variance in different seasonal periods. So if I take the logarithm, I will be able to reduce the variance of the seasonality and try to make it as stationary as possible, right? So that's the second method of transformation. The third method is seasonal differencing where uh, if I've got a yearly data and if I prove that, you know, I've got a 12 month seasonality, I will go ahead and take the difference between the first data point and the 12th data point, which is the lag of 12, right? So that, clearly I do this to get rid of the seasonality from the data, right? If I take the difference, I'm, I'm gonna get rid of the seasonality component. I'm just gonna take the difference of it and just move along, right? So from a non-stationary data it becomes a stationary data because the variance is something what i'm trying to knock out from the time series so that's seasonal differencing so it could be a 12 lag in case of there is a 12 month seasonality and it's monthly uh, data available or it could be a four four lag four quarters data right in case of one year is being represented by four quarters then i can, can go ahead with four four lags um, to the order of four to get the seasonality um, out or you know any sort of a pattern out of the data and to make the data stationary right uh, still if it is not working you can you can go ahead once you create the logarithm you can try it to difference it uh, right by using a first order difference on the log data right again apply differencing on top of it and you will get to see uh, the data may get stationary. So that's that's. these are the four techniques what generally we use to get the data to a stationary point. So as a rule of thumb, when the properties of a time series does not depend on time, that means your trend is a property which depends on time, right? So as time moves on, either it could be an uptrend or a lower trend, right? And seasonality is again, it's, it's, it's a property of the time. So if there are no such properties which are dependent on time, that's when I'll say that my time series is a stationary data, right? But however, there could be cyclical behavior in the data. There could be no trend, no seasonality, but the long cycles um, happen to be there. So that means uh, if there are cycles in the data and with no trend and seasonality visible, I can still consider that data as stationary because if I put a mean line, that mean line is going to be a straight line across time. So that's where, you know, I have a stationary data in my hand. Okay. So once you have a data set, right, and you're, you're convinced that, yes, of course, I want to go ahead and build an ARIMA model. These are the steps or sequence of events you will go through to get a good forecast for you. So first is to business analyze the data, which I've shown here. Before getting into details, statistics, number crunching, we're gonna go and talk to the real process owners, to the SMEs, to the business analysts, how this business works, right? We're gonna get a first-hand information from them. What kind of seasonality, what kind of cyclical behavior, what kind of a trend do we expect uh, in this data? So we're gonna make a note of all of those things 
this is this is the single source of truth to get to know the real process so data may be telling you the truth may not be telling you the truth you never know if there is a problem with the data you could see different patterns and different behaviors in the data so for you to corroborate corroborate right you certainly will need this piece of information from the horse's mouth and then is when you will definitely go ahead and start analyzing the data right you create or you plot a time series and check for if there is a trend component or seasonality component or the data whether the data is stationary or not right is the data under an attack of outliers um is the are the variance constant across time periods or you know you have a multiplicative model and additive model so a lot of information comes through basic data analysis once you plot the time series chart and then the third task to you is to make the data stationary so either by differencing or by taking the logarithm or taking the seasonal differences or by taking the differences of the log data eventually you're going to make your data stationary right only then you can proceed with your arima right once you declare that you okay we have we have um we have made the data stationary we will not be able to go ahead and use your arima so that's that's the bottom line getting the data stationary is key to arima so we got to keep that in mind okay so i'm going to take a quick example here uh, and uh, show you how to build an arima model right so for that i would i would want to take your attention to this case study of tractor sales for 12 years you know so tractors the the ones what we use generally to plow fields right so i've collected the data for 12 years between a data period of 2003 and 2014 and i've got monthly tractor sales uh, available and i really want to go ahead and build a narima model there right so even before i could start of any analysis i would go ahead and do a discussion with the business owners to understand what has been my business trends what's been my business cycles the seasonality in the data so on and so forth and i gather as much as information from them right before i go ahead and start right so the first thing is that business discussion so obviously from that business discussion you will by default understand that yes there is a seasonality and my tractor sales peaks um when i'm closing um or when i'm i'm probably approaching my peak um of um my monsoon because i do plowing of my fields during june july august times or maybe i start from late april where you know i get the early showers once the mud is smooth you know i go ahead and plow it and sow my seeds so that you know the seeds get deep rooted and then i get a good yield for that particular year and then i really don't buy many of the tractors post august because probably monsoon is over and that's where you know i take maximum advantage if the showers are getting shifted by a couple of months also my sales will have a probably an impact so that's when during the first showers when the people will get into the dealership and then buy their tractors because if you buy tractors in any other period you know it's going to be useless right it's going to remain in your garage so that's the business insight you will get and then of course you will get your data and you plot a time series so this is what i've plotted you know you could either do it in an excel or it could be in minitab or in r software right so so for simplicity let me let me open mini tab for you right so let's let's go ahead and see how this is getting worked in the mini tab right okay so i'm going to open all right so i have got these data prefetch so disregard anything what you see after this this is the year data yearly data and this is the number of tractor sold right so what i'm going to do is first to create a time series um plot for this right to to ensure that you know we have the right amount of information to analyze the data so let's let's do a quick time series plot for this how do i do it i just go to my mini tab go to stat i'm going to click here right spare with me for a minute yes i'm going to click on stat on top of the toolbar and then go to time series and time series plots just bear with me for a minute i'm going to show that on the screen right away mm, time series plot yes there you go 
So I clicked on stat, I clicked on time series, and I'm getting a window like this, right? So I'm gonna do a simple time series. Go okay, okay. Right, so such a window has already come, right? So the first task is to get my tractor sold data here, and then the time scale. I'm gonna use an index stamp, right? The month and a year, and click on OK. And OK, so this is gonna generate a time series data for me, right? So this is how we do this in Minitab, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you that on the screen, the final time series plot. Okay, okay. So what you see on the screen today is now is this time series plot, which we have built in Minitab. So obviously I see there's something peaking up between the April, May, June, July, August types, right? And then it falls down and picks up and obviously the variance is not constant. The, the, the seasonality component does not have a constant variance. It keeps changing and I've got a strong trend pattern as well. Right, so this is this is so we we we're very clear that the data is not stationary now, and there's a lot of information in the data which we need to extract out. Uh, to do that, in order to do that, we have to ensure that you know we have picked up, um, uh, we have made the data stationary. That's very very important. That's key to us, right? To make the data stationary and then start extracting the AR components, MA components, and the I components from the data. So first task us to get the data stationary now. So how do we do that? We do. We can do that in again in Minitab, right? So let me quickly show you how to work this out in Minitab. Just bear with me for a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my screen with the data. You all can see that now, okay? So first step is to get, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disregard all those things which you don't need now. So. As we had discussed, you know, the first step is to get the variance under control. So I'm going to take the logarithm of it. I hope you can see my data screen. Yes. So I'll go to calculator, right, on on the tall uh, on the top toolbar. I've got something called a CALC, and within CALC, I've got something called a calculator. So I click on calculator. So let me show that to you how the calculator looks like. There we go. So this is the class calculator. Right? So you can see the calculator. So in the calculator, I'm going to tell the calculator where to store the results. So I'll go ahead and tell him to store it in C3, column C3. Okay. And then what's the expression? I want to create the log to the base 10 for the tractor sales. So I'm going to take a log to the base of 10. The number which I need is the number of tractors sold. And I'm going to assign a formula so that it gets applied to all the cells on the in the row okay so and click ok so that's going to give me the results let me show you yes so i applied that calculator and then the minitab throws out this result for me so now my task is to analyze this log data and see whether my data has become stationary from a variance point of view, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and check it once again, go to time series, time series plot. I'm going to show you that on the screen. So I'll go to time series, time series plot. Okay, and then click on simple, click OK. Uh, and then I'm going to get the log 10 here and the timestamp will remain the same. Click on OK. Yes. So what you can see on the screen right now is the resultant of my Yes. What you can see on my screen right now is the resultant of my stationarized data. I see that the variance has been normalized and I really don't have variance uh, in the seasonality pattern, it's a constant variance across. But still, I can see that there is a strong influence of variance plus trend, sorry, a uh, strong influence of seasonality plus trend in the data set. So I have to basically make the data stationary. Only from a stationary data will I be able to extract maximum information. So 
now I have extracted the information and I have got to a stage where my variance problem has been solved. Now I just want to have this data settle down with a constant mean. So my task, one of one of one of the things what I can do, we did discuss, is to take the differences of this, right? So let's go ahead and see in how, how we take the differences of this in Minitab, okay? Okay, so now I'm going to take the difference of the log. So I'm creating a column called as difference. So how do I take the difference? It's easy in Minitab. You again go to start and then go to time series. And there is something called as differences. So I'm going to show the video on, on your screen how the differences have come. So in Minitab, there is something called as differences. And this is how it comes. You go to start go to time series and you pick up differences and this window is going to come so what are we going to do with this window so with this window we're going to take the series as locked in this is already logged and i want to store the data in c4 and the lag is one subsequent data points difference between subsequent data points i'm going to click ok so this is going to store the different data for me so obviously the first data point will be missing is this I don't have a reading before this right so because of that so let me show you the screen here yes there you go so Minitab has already given me the difference data so this data point will be missing because of the fact that you know I don't have a previous data point so I cannot take the difference but from here I can get the data points because I take the difference of between this two take the difference between these two take the difference between these two and i get get it recorded so so that's gonna that's i'm expecting the data to be stationary by doing this so how do we check it we go to again stat go to time series time series plot and i'm going to show that on your screen right now time series mini tabs time series plot okay and you're going to go ahead and click on okay here right and then take the difference data right and then the time series uh, timestamp will remain the same month to year this will be the timestamp we're using stamp and brought the data right here and click on okay boom look at it so my my previous data which was showing variance and sorry uh, seasonality and trend is no more existing now right so i kill the tree trend and i've also my seasonality is out of the window right mostly out of the window i don't see a strong pattern whatsoever right so what do i do here in this case i kind of call this data as stationary right so we have enough uh, proof to show that you know my data is stationary they can you can do this in two ways right you can easily create a box plot uh, and break it into number of years 12 box plots will be there and see whether the means the means are equal or not so you can look and even do an ANOVA and and see whether the means are constant or not if you your test turns out to be um, you know favorable to your null hypothesis then that means your data is stationary and you can go ahead and um, start doing your already my analysis so this is let me show that in your screen as well what was the time series plot yes so this is what i was talking about sorry your window went blank so this is the time series for the difference data we see that the data is kind of settled and it is stationary at this point in time so what i was talking about is you can use these data points and create some block box plots by grouping the data because you've got 12 years of data so you can club all months data into one one group for that particular year and just try to run the box plots just do a quick ANOVA you'll get to see that and that's exactly what you see here we were discussing about these charts we have already created right we stabilized we took the logarithm right and then we found that you know the variance problem has been settled but a strong trend in the seasonality lies in the data so we go ahead and did this differencing and we got this data we saw that in mini tab now isn't it right yes and then as i told you i grouped 
12 data points into one and called it as 2003 and I created a box plot for it and put the means line. I see that, you know, the means lines kind of um, covering in the center, kind of a straight line, which I'm assuming I can go ahead and do an ANOVA on this, you know, taking 12 levels of data and prove that whether my my means are equal or not. So if you turn out to be uh, with the result that the means are equal, that means your data is stationary. Go ahead and do it, right? Okay, so in the next step, how do we do? What do we do is to extract those AR, MA and I components. So I component has already been extracted. We know we took the first differencing. So the I component is present in the Rima model. It's going to be an integrated model. Now we need to identify what is the AR component and what is the MA component out of these graphs. So there is a, a tool or a technique what we generally use to plot the ACF and the PACF chart. So ACF and PACF charts are going to autocorrelation function and partial autocorrelation function. This is going to give you a good understanding in terms of um, how to read out or how to extract these components from the time series. So let's go ahead and do that in Excel. I want to, uh, sorry, in Minitab, how to do a PSEF chart, right? So it's very important that I go back to my Minitab basic screens. Hope you can see that. Okay, so now that I have got my difference data, I need to extract the components from this difference data. So how do I do that? Very simple. I go to again stat. I go to time series and there is something called as an autocorrelation, right? So I click on autocorrelation and there is a tab which is going to pop out. So let me show you what is the autocorrelation tab looks like. So this is the autocorrelation tab, what you can see on my screen, right? So in this screen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the series as difference data from C4. That's my series and number of lags, you know, you, if you want, you can put the number of lags what you are interested in or, you know, you can put the defa default number of lags. You can ask Minitab to take the default number of lags and then store ACF, T statistics and uh, box Q statistics. OK, so I'm going to click on OK. So you will get to see this graph popping off. Two things will come. Right. I hope you can see this. Right. So one of the key things what you need to look at in this output is that, you know, yes, I've got an ECF, I've got a T stat, and then I've got the um, uh, chi-square values, uh, uh, the LBQ values in the end. I'm going to explain to you all of these things in a jiffy. So let me see what is there in this graph. So this is called as an autocorrelation function or an ACF plot, right? So this red line is the significant line, right? If any tall bars of the blue bars goes beyond this range, that means there is a significant correlation with these lags. So how do we read this chart? So I've got data till the 35th, 40th lag of 36 lags. So first data point, the correlation between the subsequent data points is the first lag correlation or the first lag. Second lag is between the first and the second. Third lag is between the first and the third, right? So I have individually studied the correlations between these data points and I've plotted in this ACF diagram. So I see that, you know, there are instances, I mean, the sixth lag is going beyond and I have a significant correlation there of minus 7.6, right? Minus is a negative correlation uh, between my first data point and the sixth data point, right? And then there is, I see a very strong correlation at the 12th data point. You need to remember this had a strong 12 month seasonality. And that is the reason why I see that, you know, these lags at 12, 24 and 36 are significant because of the seasonality, right? So this is the data points are not random in the ACF. It, it gives you a lot of confidence that yes, there is a lot of seasonal information lying in this or autocorrelation lying in this data point, which can be extracted and we can we can amount for the AR and MA components from this data point. Okay, so 
here one more thing what you really need to do is this is the autocorrelation and the next you need to create the partial autocorrelation function as well so go to stat again time series there is something called as partial autocorrelation i hope that you can see my partial autocorrelation screen now go to stat time series partial autocorrelation there you go this is what it is a window what you would be able to see the partial correlation so in partial correlation again i'm going to take the differenced data as my series number of defaults store t statistics and pscf and i'm going to click ok so this is going to throw out a partial correlation chart for me now okay so i hope that you can see my screen yes partial correlation so partial correlation, the difference between these two are, it's very important that you understand these two graphs very, very clearly. I hope that you can see this, right? So autocorrelation talks about the correlation between the data points, right? The subsequent data points, the first data point, the second data point, first data point, third data point, first data point, the fourth data point. So in, in, in autocorrelation, we consider the direct impact of the correlation between the first data point and the third data point, but there are indirect effect, um, uh, impacts also. When you are studying between first and the third, there is an indirect impact or an effect which the second is generating on the first uh, as well, right? So that's called as an indirect. So when you are talking about autocorrelation or in an ACF chart, although we are talking about the third lag, that third lag will contain the direct and the indirect con contribution. So that's exactly what you will see here in this chart. But whereas partial autocorrelation, only the direct impact or the direct effects between the data points are studied, the other things are disregarded. So for instance, if I'm taking a lag of four, that my first data point is the correlation between the first data point and the fourth data point, I will strictly study only these correlation between the first and the fourth, the indirect correlation of the first on second, third and first and third and fourth and second and third. I'm not studying. I'm disregarding. I'm removing it out and then partially studying only the impact between first and fourth. And these two charts are really important and critical for you to decide on the next steps. So I'll give you some thumb of rule right so how to how to understand that you know a particular chart is representing something or not so in an autocorrelation chart right you you need to typically look at that you know the um, if the chart is like this the first lag is the most powerful and then it has a gradual decrease and it cuts over from the significant zone and approaches zero that means a gradual decrease where in this slide or, or on the or on the graph what you see on your screen the behavior is not existing if such a behavior is existing that means there is a gradual decrease in significance level as the lag increases my correlation strength the, the correlation coefficient is also decreasing that means the degree of correlation is also getting decreasing and it diminishes and in the contrary, for the same data point, right, if you can see in the partial correlation, uh, instead of a gradual decrease like this, there is an abrupt end. So maybe after one or two lags, you know, all the other lags are going insignificant. That's going to be under the blue red line. That means there is a strong AR function. The process is an AR function and the MA component is not there and the number of lags to be considered for an AR is determined by looking at how many significant bars are there. Like for instance, after the second bar in the MA process, after the first bar, all the other bars are going down. That means it's a first order AR process, right? There is no MA component. So in the contrary, right, if you really look at your autocorrelation, If this does not gradually decrease, the way I explained to you PACF, it is having an abrupt end after one or two lags. All of these things are going to go insignificant under the red line and there is nothing which is beyond the red in the remaining lags. And your PACF graph, your PACF is showing a 
constant decrease the way we discussed in the ACF you know that is decreasing like this after a few significant lags everything is going under the significant and slowly approaching zero that means there is an MA process right there is no AR component that's only an MA component available and you got to go look at your ACF and PACF and see where the drop happens and that would be the number of lags you would need to consider as a MA component in your ARIMA model, right? So this, this is the rule of thumb. You need to look at the way the charts are behaving and how many lags are significant and those many lags are basically your building components for your. So if it is an ARIMA model, AR model, you're going to look at for that pattern and then how many lags are significant, you're going to take that number 2, 3, 4, 1, 2 and just put there that, you know, it is an AR order of order of 1 right and obviously in this case we have taken the differencing uh, so differencing first level differencing so it's one and then moving average if there is a moving average to what degree or to what lags the correlation is significant you need to look at this graph and if it's a first lag again it goes to one so in this case i see that you know it is not an ar process it looks like it is um it is um MA process for me because you know AR in, in AR I see that you know there are no gradual decrease it's an abrupt change and I only see seasonality in here and in my PACF right the partial total correlation I really don't see any major lags but you know this correlation settles down and approaches zero as we move along so I can assume that it may be an MA process without an AR component to it and the lag is significant only at the first order right so i may take that as a first order ma process with differencing of one right so my model could be a zero for M M ar one for um integrated and then one for moving it so it could be a zero one one since there is a seasonality there's a seasonal arima PDQ gets replicated so 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 with a seasonality at 12 months could be my model to be used right so that's that's exactly what I want to show you in the PowerPoint let's switch over to the PowerPoint okay so we as a rule of thumb I just discussed and I just explained to you so taking above clues we see that you know there are no AR components, only one MA component and one integrated component. So PDQ, so the values of P, P is become zero because there is no AR component in there. My differencing, I've taken first level differencing. If I had taken second level of differencing instead of one, I could have put two here. So in this case, we have taken the first level of differencing and the MA component, I could see that there is only one because after the first lag, all of the other things are getting insignificant because the f subsequent lags are just because of the seasonality element right so this is the non-seasonal part of your arima model and this gets your seasonal part so in the seasonal part again you know i've taken one difference to get the seasonality of the radar and it is definitely an ma process right with uh, a significant lag of the first level only i if, if there was if, if the tall bars were getting um, cut after the second lag that means you know there is a significant still the second lag or the second order correlation also exists you know this could have become instead of one I would have written two, two here so this becomes my model with a strong seasonality of 12 month seasonality right so this gets tricky sometimes you know it's not very easy to decipher this uh, so I, I can also show in my the second part of this video how to use R to identify such a behavior, right? And to get the right model to be used for ARIMA forecasting. But for now, I've, I've shown you how to do this in Minitab already, right? You know, you go to stat, time series, make your log data, right? By taking, go to calculator, taking the logarithm and then you know how to forecast now in Minitab is very important, right? So I go ahead, go back to Minitab. I hope that you can see my Minitab screen now. So yes, there's a Minitab screen. So the next thing is to create generate forecast because I've already identified the AR, PQ and D, PDQ models, the components. 
so I'm gonna to go to start time series Arima right let me I'm not sure whether you can see my screen so far just give me a minute yes so so when I go click I'm gonna get this window right so in this window it's very important that I feed the log 10 series which has my trend component and my seasonal component right both the components are present in this data series uh, by taking the differencing I've I've killed all these things so I've, I've I'm going to take that log 10 series and yes there is a seasonality of 12 I'm telling mini tab yes you got to check for the seasonality of the 12 month and the non-seasonal component obviously I log 10 right so it's zero auto regressive there is no AR component in there so yes I've taken a one level difference and moving average yes I've, I'm expecting it to be one for the seasonal bit this is for the non-seasonal bit and for the seasonal bit again there is no AR component in there of course I've taken one difference to bring down the seasonality you got to take one difference to bring down the seasonality and the moving average I seen that that is about one right you know I, I could see that in the PACF chart that's one so include a constant term it's like regression it's a, again right what's a constant when your y value when when your x value approaches um, zero what could be your corresponding y value so that's the constant so I'm gonna include that constant term and I got to generate around 36 forecast points or you know I want to forecast for next 36 months and the origin is 144 I'm asking Minitab uh, two things to uh, store this data say the forecast I want to store in C10 or say C11 upper limit I want to store in the column C10 or maybe to be on the safer side C15 and then C14 so I don't want to override anything and upper limit C16 okay and then click okay okay so before we get there I hope you could see one second let me show you that how we did it stat time series arima right I hope that you could follow till there mini tab stat time series arima Okay, so it's times Arima you've got it and you put the log 10 and now we're gonna click on the forecast right what happens when you click on the forecast I just want to show you that window before we move on so I've clicked on forecast so I when I click on forecast there's such a window happens so I need lead means how many forecast points I need I need 36 months forecast origin is 144 I've got 12 years of data 144 data points are there so I want to origin I want to start from 144 data point and I want to store the forecast in column C15 of mini tab lower limit confidence limit C14 and upper confidence limit and, and I'm going to go ahead and click on OK right so when I click OK that's when this window comes and then again I'm going to click OK here so when I click OK a new window has popped up let me show you the windows okay a couple of videos have popped up here so let's go one by one right this is the time series plot I hope that you are able to see this time series plot yes so it has generated the 36 months forecast you know you wanted from 144 
So it is started from 144, right? It is generated 36 months of data for you, right? So here, uh, the forecast is ready. And then two things you need to validate here is the ACF of the residuals. So this is the residuals. So technically there should not be any tall bars or any more information left out in this because you've taken the residuals and then you're trying to plot the ACF. And similarly, you get to see the PACF as well. So when you see PACF again, there are no significant things. So how to conclude, you know, we have extracted maximum information and there is no more information lying in this data set anymore. You have you've extracted maximum, you have used the PDQ model, uh, ARIMA model, you have asked Minitab to forecast that. And then now here you have the forecast, which is already seen there. So one thing which you have to keep in mind is to always go to your session window. So let me show you the session window. This is the result, right? This, these are the key results of your ARIMA model. So what you need to see here is that uh, or probably I can. So this is how you get the session window. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. In PowerPoint, I've tried to explain it very clearly. So this is what you will look at for in the session window in Minitab. Minitab does iterations, multiple iterations. Still, they get to the minimum sum of square errors. That's what SSC sum of square errors. It is minimized. It started from round two and found the parameters what you really need to use for the ARIMA forecasting, right? So that's what um, is recorded here. The moving average one, the coefficient GB used is 0.3996, which is approximated to four. And then 0.61 is the estimate well coefficient and the constant value is going to be 0.000836. This is the constant we have included. And these are basically my MA component and I don't have an AR component. So these are the constants what I will be using for my seasonality. And this is the for the non-seasonal data, right? And using these parameters, I'm going to create the equation and then create the forecast accordingly. Uh, and one more thing what you really need to look at is this. Um, this SSC is something what you will need to say how accurate is your data. So obviously, when you look at this slide alone and look at one single SSC value, you wouldn't be able to assess. So if you're creating multiple models, these values can get compared to the other models and whichever has got the minimum SSC will be chosen as the preferred one. So we've just done one here. So I'm just telling you, this is the value which you really need to look at uh, to confirm whether your model is a reliable model or not. And finally, this is a chi-square test done on the residuals, right? It's a hypothesis test. The null hypothesis says that, you know, it's a good fit what you have created and the alternate hypothesis, it's not a good fit. So obviously, when the p-values are significant is when you will have to reject on our hypothesis and say that it is not a good fit. So here at a 95% interval, 95% confidence, we see that it's 0.39. So it's the 39% risk when you are rejecting our hypothesis. I will not reject my null hypothesis. So that means this is a good fit. The goodness of fit is fine. The fine, uh, the fit what I've made from a residual point of view, and we did it in, in the PACF, and we did see that in PACF and SCF, that there are uh, no more information lying. So that means it's a good fit for me. So all the lags, 12, 24, 36, and 48, the residuals are not significant and it's a good model to be used, right? So this is how you do in ARIMA in Minitab. I'm gonna post another video soon, how to do the entire steps, what we discussed in R. And it's gonna be a shorter video. It's gonna be easier for you as well. Uh, and I hope that you enjoyed the video and I, I hope that you understood how to apply ARIMA and how to do ARIMA using a mini tab. In case if you've got any questions, please feel free to drop an email at info at the rate trainform.com. I shall clear your doubts and we can also get onto a WebEx session if required if you have further doubts. Uh, so happy learning to you all. Um, just keep using these techniques in your projects and your area of work. And um, let's let's get to the next level. Thank you so much for watching the video.